1 Peter chapter 5. Uh, we'll be looking at one verse, but we have covered as uh, actually 14 verses in 1 Peter chapter 5. We'll be looking at one verse, but we'll try to see if we can't cover most of these verses as we look at it. So 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. Reading from the King James, and it reads, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walking about seeking whom he may devour. You may be seated. Um, before we get into the title, I want to say a word of prayer to get our hearts and minds right so we might receive what God has to say to us. Let us pray. Now, Lord God, we thank you for an opportunity to share in your word with your people once again. We pray, Lord, that you would have your way in this place, that you would illuminate our minds, that you would open up our hearts, that we would be able to grasp and internalize and live out what does say the Lord. In times like these, we need a word from you. In times like these, we know that Christ is our rock. In times like these, it's good to know Jesus. And so we pray now that you would help me decrease, that you might increase. And let me preach your word with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, that all our hearts may be touched and lives may be changed. In other words, Lord, let me preach with power. Thank you for all that you have done and all that you will do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So in this epistle, the Apostle Peter is writing during a time of great persecution to the Christians. He's writing about A.D. 65. Uh, there was three different persecution periods under Nero, Domitian, and Trajan. Uh, it was Nero who took the Christians and burned them at the stake. It was Nero who took the Christians and put certain type of clothes on them and smeared them in certain blood and put them out before the animals and the animals would rip them apart. It was Nero who would put the Christians in the arena and tie their limbs to chariots and pull them apart. It was Nero who was called by some the Antichrist. And so Peter is writing to the Christians to let them know that even though they're going through trials and tribulations, God is not finished with them. Even though they're going through difficult times, God is with them in the midst. So the title I use today is Watch Out. Watch Out. I got that title from the New Living Translation. The New Living Translation uh, translates this verse this way. Stay alert. Watch out. For your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking for someone to devour. If, if anybody knew about the attacks of the devil and his schemes, it was Peter. It was the same Peter that said to the Lord, I don't care what these other disciples are going to do, but when times get hard, I would never deny you. And the Lord said, Peter, before the cock crow, twins, thou shalt deny me three times. It was Peter who, who was so anxious and so angry that he took out his sword and cut off the ear of the high priest's servant, whom Jesus said, put up your sword, sword back into your sheet. Don't you know that I can speak to my father now and he can give me 12 leads and angels? But, but how can the scriptures be fulfilled? And Jesus healed his ear. It was Peter that Jesus had to say, get thee behind me, Satan, for thou savest the things that be uh, of the world and not of God. Peter. You know Peter, don't you? Hot-tempered Peter. Quick dance. How many Peters we have in the church? Some of y'all got some hot tempers. If you had a sword, you just cut somebody up. 
Well, let me tell you something. You don't need an iron sword. Some of us got some swords in our mouths, and we cut some people up quick. Peter's going to help us. It was Peter that the Lord said in Luke chapter 22, verses 31 and 32, he said this. He says, Simon, Simon, you know how your mother had to get your attention and call your name twice? You ever heard that? Some of you parents got some kids. You know how hard head they are. And you got to say, Johnny, Johnny, Hector, Hector. My mama said, Alan, Alan. I said, oh, yes, ma'am. The first time she didn't get me. But if she said it twice, I knew if I didn't answer, I'd be in trouble. And so Jesus, Jesus said in Luke chapter 22, verses 31 and 32, he says, Simon, Simon, Satan has desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith fail not. And when you are strengthened, are con- con- strengthened then are converted, strengthen your brethren. In other words, when you are turned back, When you are brought back into unity with me, not unity, but faith and and obedience, strengthen your brother. It was that Peter. So if anybody knew about trials and tribulation, attacks of the devil, it was Peter. Look what he says in chapter 4, starting at verse 12, as we move into our sermon text. He says, listen, beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to test you as though some strange thing happened to you. He said, listen, when you're going through trials and tribulation, children and adults, he said, don't think it's strange. If Christ went through trials and tribulation and suffering, don't you think you're going to go through? If the Son of God had to go through some things for us, don't you think we're going to go to do some things ourselves? He he says, think it not strange. Then this is strange to me, but verse 13, he says, but rejoice in as much as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. Look at verse 14. If you be reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you, are happy, for the spirit of glory and of God rested upon you. On their part, he is evil spoken of, but on your part, he is glorified. And then in verse 19, he says, Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. You know what? Peter is like a cowboy with his rope. And with these words in, words in chapter verse 19, he lassoes us and brings us into the corral of God's safety. He says, listen, when you're going through the fiery trials, listen, when you're suffering according to the will of God, commit your souls to him. In well-doing, as unto a faithful creator. He said, God knows what he's doing when you go through the trials and tribulations of life. Tony, God knows where you are. He knows exactly what you're going through. But when he takes you through the fires and trials of life, he has to shape you and mold you because you got to look like Jesus. You're not there yet. So when we find ourselves in trials and tribulations, we're, we're not there yet. We don't talk like Jesus enough. We don't walk like Jesus enough. We don't think like Jesus enough. So what God has to do, he has to take us through those fires and shape us and mold us so when somebody like Unique sees you, she sees Jesus. When she hears you, she hears the voice of the Messiah. Because you need to make an impact on somebody like Unique. You need to bring her out from the cold and into the warmth of God's love. So Peter says, when you're going through, commit your souls to God. But somebody told you that you're not supposed to suffer in the body of Christ, didn't they? Somebody told you that you're going to have just wonderful days when you come to believe in Jesus Christ. Somebody told you that you're always going to be the head and never the tail. Somebody told you that you're always going to be laughing in the body of Christ. Somebody told you a lie. You said, Reverend Ford, you got to put a disclaimer on that because we got little kids. You know, little kids hear that stuff on the playground. Don't y'all? Y'all know when people tell them to fib, stretching the truth. What are the words y'all lose when people lie? Oh, just lie. 
That's about the best word for it, right? Because the Bible says, thou shall not lie. You know how I know? This ain't even in the script, Joe. Walt. You know how I know? Because I used to be the president of the Lodge Club. I was just a member. I was the president. I was good at lying. Well, I can tell you one and you thought you think it was the truth. I turned my head and said, man, I got them. But a lie will catch up with you sooner or later. So this is Peter. He wants to let us know that as we go through the trials and tribulations, God is with us. So as we Get into this sermon. Watch out. I want to give you three quick things, things that you can take home with you. In verse 8, we want to see the admonition. It's really a warning. The adversary and then the answer. That's what we want to see today. And so the apostle Peter, whom Satan has desired to sift like wheat, who was going through the fires and of life, the tribulation of life, he, he writes to us by experience. And he says, I want you to understand something. I want to warn you. I want to give you this admonition, this warning. I want you to hear me now. The, the first thing he says when he gives us this admonition in verse 8, he says, uh, be sober-minded. That's the first thing. He says, be sober-minded. This is a Greek word, and, and, and the Greek word is uh, ne." Fay, a nefu, and it's spelled N-E-P-H-O. And, and, and what the word means, it has two things here. The, the word means not to be intoxicated with strong drink and not to be intoxicated with worries and the cares of this world. He says you can't be sober-minded if you're drunk. And you can't be sober-minded if you are worried about the cares and anxieties and the things of this world. He says, listen, you have to make sure that, that your mind is sober. And to help us, he says, if, if you really want to have a sober mind, in verse 5 he says, then you have to be submissive to the will of God. Likewise, ye younger, be submissive to the other. Likewise, ye, yea, all of you be submissive one to another. And be commode, clothed with humility. He says, if you really want to be sober-minded, he says, then you have to learn how to submit one to another. Children, you have to learn how to submit to the authority that's over you that's doing right. Submit to your parents. Submit to your Sunday school teachers. Submit to your teachers at school. Submit to the authority that's over you. And then he says, so in case you don't miss it, all of y'all, all of us should be submissive one to another. And he tells you why. Because God resists the proud. But when we're submissive to the will of God, to the word of God, and to the way of God, he says then God gives us more grace. I don't know about you, but I need some more grace. I, I remember yesterday we had to cook off and the chicken, everything was chicken. And y'all know I was smiling, right? But I was eating and I was eating slow because I ate a whole lot of chicken plates. And then Deacon Hall said, yeah, I think you... Then I got enough chicken. I said, no, Deacon Hall. I said, uh, uh, when God gives us grace for the day, that was grace for the day. I, and, and I need grace for tomorrow. I said, so the chicken I ate today, that was chicken for the day. But, but when Sunday get here, I'm going to get some chicken for tomorrow. But what I'm trying to tell you is God will give you grace for the day. And, and it's good grace for the day, but, but I need more grace. I need some grace to deal with the trials and tribulations of tomorrow. Because if I'm living, living, trials and tribulations going to come your way. It's not if they come, it's when they come. And if you're submissive to the will, word, and way of God, he'll give you more grace. Not, not just grace, but more grace. Grace heaped upon grace. And that's what Peter is saying. He said, be submissive to the will of God. And then he says, in verse 6, he says, there must be humility under the mighty hand of God. Look what he says. He says, humble yourself, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may what? Exalt you in due time. You see, we got we to humble ourselves because God resists the proud, doesn't he? God loves those who humble themselves. James 4.10 says it this way. 
humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. You, you want to be lifted up? Then walk with humility before God. Then walk with humility before one another. And if you humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, he shall lift you up. But, but Peter puts it this way again. Humble yourself in the mighty hand of God, and he will exalt you in due time. When is due time? It's the right time according to the wisdom of God. I wrote this down. The Bible says that God will not put on you more than you can bear. But we with the temptation make a way out, right? Listen, listen, my brothers and sisters. After we have been through some distant lands, spent some time in some dark valleys, been disappointed by some close friends, been raked over the coals, encountered what we call Murphy's Law. Anything that can go wrong will go wrong. After we have suffered a while, God says that I will lift you up or exalt you in due time. When is due time? It's God's time. And in God's time, he said, I won't leave you bent over because a man can't ride you back, Martin Luther King said, unless you're bent. God said, I won't leave you bent over, but I'll lift you up in due time. And you can walk with your head up. You're going to go through some trials and tribulations in your life. But God says, if you humble yourself under my mighty hand, that's omnipotence. God said, I'll lift you up. I'll exalt you. You may be the tail, but I'll make you the head. You may be going through now, but I'll raise you up. And it's good to know that God is doing the lifting because the burdens are too heavy for me. I can't get myself out of some traps that I even got myself into. I'm not like you guys. I get myself into trouble. I know I get myself into trouble. But it's good to know that I serve a God who can bring me out of the trouble I get myself in. He. So if you want to be sober-minded, you, you got to be submissive to the will of God. You got to be humble under the mighty hand of God. And then in verse 7, he says, casting all your cares upon him for he cares for you. He says, you know what you got to do? You, you got to be dependent upon the cares of God. That's what it means. Now, this phrase has two things in it. He says, you got to take your cares and anxieties, and the Greek word means to throw them on God. You know, in other words, you ever had some wet clothes on? And you know it, and it make you feel sticky, and you're like, man, I got to get out of those clothes. You take them all quick and just throw them in the washer. Look what he's talking about. Take your cares and your anxieties and throw them on God. And then he tells you the second half means because God affectionately cares for you. In other words, he says God loves you. And God wants you to take your cares and throw them on him. Take your anxieties. What are you worried about? You can't even change what you're worried about. I, I tried to figure it out when I was wearing one day. I said, I'm going to wear it and see if I can fix it. Yeah. You ever tried that? Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. And, and, and when I got to the end of my worrying, when I woke up the next day, I still had the same problem. My worrying didn't fix it. It gave me a headache. I didn't sleep good. My wife would tell you, I don't worry a lot. No, I ain't got time. I, I say, okay, Lord, if you can't fix your people through your word, then they won't be fixed. Now, I ain't talking about Grace First Baptist Church. I'm just talking about Kevin Nelson said what I'm talking about. Because I love all of y'all. And I thank y'all for making me that chicken yesterday. But, but he says, you got to be dependent upon God. See, children, I know you want to be independent, but right now you need to be dependent upon your parents. And, and when you leave the care of your parents, you got to go and give your dependency. You got to be dependent upon God because there are going to be some times in your life that your thinking and your wisdom and your cleverness is not going to get you out. I don't care how much you cry. I don't care how much money you have. You're going to need Jesus Christ to get you out. When you go to the doctor and the doctor says you have cancer, I don't care how much money you got, you can't buy your way out of cancer. But I know a man who can deliver you from cancer. And you got to take your cares and cast them upon Jesus Christ. Because he cares for you. 
It's good to know that God cares for us. I love my wife and children, but God says, I affectionately care for you. That means everything you're going through, I know about, and I'm going to fix it for you. I'm going to fix it for you. So if you're going to be sober-minded, then you got to be submissive, right? You, you got to be humble, and you got to be dependent upon God. And then in the next part of that verse, he says, be vigilant. It, it, the word is a Greek word. It means gray, gore you. In other words, it means stay alert. It, it, it's, it's the military terms because Romans had centurions everywhere and they had guards everywhere. And he says, listen, you have to stay alert. You, 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 you can't fall asleep on the job. I know some of you go to work and you try to get a little cat nap. I know y'all do it. Because I'm telling you, I did it when I was at my job. Now, now, I don't do it on this job. Now, I tell them I'm going to go to sleep on this job. When I go in the office, I said, man, I got a headache. I'm tired. I'm closing my door. But back then at USA, since I don't work there anymore, I go sneak off. You got to be alert. You got to be alert. You know, Eugene Peterson takes this verse, and he prays. The first half, he, he prays this way. He says, keep a cool head. See, see, when, when you're dealing with some things, you, you got to keep a cool head. You, you got to keep a cool head and stay alert. Don't be fretting around. Don't be worrying about tomorrow because he holds tomorrow. Keep a cool head. You can't deal with your adversary if you don't keep a cool head. You can't deal with Satan if you don't stay alert. Be on guard, my brothers and sisters. Guard your minds. Guard your souls. Guard your hearts. For it are the issues of life. Peter knew, didn't he? Because Peter didn't know how to guard his mouth. He just spoke and things came out. How do we also like Peter? We just speak and things come out. Uh, what, what had happened was, no, you didn't think before you. At least that's what Pastor Thomas said on Friday, didn't he? Words fly to hit somebody in the face. You can't take it back. Well, I didn't mean to say that. Yes, you did. No, it slipped. No, it didn't. Yeah, the tongue is a slippery place. But y'all know, because you're good, because why? We're good at lying. Man, I didn't mean to say that, man. You know, bro, bro, you know I didn't mean to say that, bro. That thing just slipped in my mind. Come on, sis, you know I was just joking. No, you weren't joking at all. I joke up here, right? That's joking, huh? But when you're hurting people with your words, that's not joking. You're tearing people down, that's not joking. You should be building people up with your words. And so we have to make sure that we on alert. One, one person says, you have to be on your post always because Satan is always on his post. You, you think the devil takes a day off? You're sadly mistaken. Satan is good at tripping us up. We take a day off on this Sunday and a day off on that Sunday. Well, the Lord knows my heart. Really? He does. So listen. He says, be vigilant. Be watchful. Then he tells you, why? Point two. He says, because your adversary, the, the devil, as a roaring lion walking about seeking. Look, look now. Look at, he says now, we're talking about the adversary, right? Let's see his description. He's called the adversary because that means, the word means a legal opponent in the courtroom. He opposes you before God night and day. He doesn't care how much you read the Bible. He doesn't care how much you pray. He doesn't care how many ties you give. He doesn't care what you look like, how many clothes you have on. He wants to accuse you before God night and day. He's a legal opponent. You know what he said? They're no good. Look at them. They don't even know how to study right. And every time they pray, they let thoughts come into their minds. And every time they say they love the brother, they don't really because they're thinking some crazy things about the brothers and sisters. Y'all know how we are in our minds. Y'all got pure thoughts all the time in y'all mind? If you think pure thoughts all the time, raise your hand. Thought so. Thought so. Right now, some of you are talking and you should be listening. Some of you are sleep, sleeping and you should be alert. Some of you are in the back rows, y'all be talking so much nobody can't even hear the sermon. Quit all that talking. I'm just trying to help you if you let me. And then we tell the children, 
We tell the children, now children, when you get to church, pay attention. We don't pay attention. His, look at his description. He's an adversary, a legal opponent. Then he says he's the devil, right? You know what that word means? He's a slanderer, accuser. And he does it night and day, night and day, night and day. He does it. You remember when Job came? You can find in Job chapter 1, verse 6, there was a time when the sons of God came to present themselves before God, and Job came, and, and Satan came, and, and God said, Satan, whence comest thou? He says, to and fro and up and down the earth. I've been looking for somebody to destroy. I've been seeking somebody to destroy. All the ones that don't go to church, I already got them. I need Job, because Job's an upright man, a good man. But the ones who don't go to church, but, every, but, but Christmas and, and Easter, I got them. I need, I need somebody like Job because Job is always praying to you. Job is always talking to you. Job is always covering for his children's sins. I want Job. God said, have you tried him? He's an upright man. You, you can try Job all you want, but Job won't deny me. He said, ah, oh, you got a hedge around him. But if you move the hedge, he said, guess what? He'll curse you. Don't you know that Satan is having a conversation as he goes before the throne? He said, listen, that boy Hutchinson, that's what he said. He don't call you a brother Hutchinson. He said, that boy Hutchinson, I can get him. I can get him. Just move the head just for one hour, and I guarantee you he'll trip up. He'll mess up. He'll curse. He'll get mad with his wife. He'll get mad at his baby girl. He'll get mad on the job. He'll say some words that he ain't said in 15 years. If you let me have him, i get him. That's the conversation going on, and that's the conversation going on with us. And you think, we, you think we're escaping? Satan said, I got him. Lord, I had him last night. Woo, he started praying, though, then he got me. If he wouldn't have been praying, Sister Davis, if he wasn't praying, I had him. If he didn't call on the name of Jesus, if he didn't plead the blood of Jesus, I had him. He was in my clutches. I tripped him up. Because I'm a roaring lion. You know, this, this other phrase about Satan, his description, not only is that uh, the devil and adversary, but it's a roaring lion. You know what this means? This phrase means that Satan is not hiding behind the bushes, even though he does, to try to trip you up. He's out front roaring at you saying, hey, I'm scaring you. I'm going to bring fear to you. I'm going to destroy you. That's what he's doing to you. And he gets us, don't he? He scares us so much that we quit coming to church like we should. He gets us too. He's slick now because he's also called an angel of light. He, he puts on Christian clothes. He has Christian terminology. He says to Jesus in the wilderness, cast yourself down. For it is written, he gives his angels charge over thee. And they will bear you up in your hand, their hands, lest you dash your foot against the stone. He'll tell you, Christian, you don't have to go to church to worship God. You can worship God in your living room. You know how independent you are. You don't need anybody to worship God but you. But he forgot about the verse, Matthew 18, 20, where two or three are gathered together in my name. There I'm in the midst. He forgot about Hebrews 10, 25, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together like the manner is, some is, but exalting one another and so much the more. He forgot about Psalm 133, 1, behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. So what Satan does, this roaring lion, he puts fear in us. And so we could come to church because we sin. No, when you sin, don't quit coming to church. When you sin, come to church, confess your sins, and let the Lord deal with all that other stuff. His description. Look at his determination. Look what it says in the text now. He, he's walking, what, to and fro, seeking whom he may devour. He's determined. He, he's like me walking back and forth over the stage. Why? I'm determined to get you this word. I don't care what goes on, I'm determined. Satan is determined. He's walking back and forth. And that's what it means. He's determined to not only trip you up, but to destroy you. He, he's determined. Up and fro and to the earth. Now, Satan isn't everywhere. So Satan is doing some things. His demon is doing some things. But make no mistake about it, children. Satan is trying to trip you up. He's determined. Dogs have fleas, don't they? Satan is going to be determined to get you. You better watch out. You better watch your lips. You better watch your eyes. You better watch where your feet carry you. 
You can't hang out in the club on Saturday shaking tail feather and come in here and talk about hallelujah. <laughs> Satan just trip you up. And he's good at it too because he'll use the simple things to get you. The simple things he'll get you. I don't have to tell you what simple things are. You know what they are. He'll use them to get you. There'll be somebody in your Sunday school class and they make you mad. Have you ever heard anybody in church just talk all the time besides the pastor? And you're in Sunday school class with them, and they're aggravating you and annoying you, and you're trying to hold on. You're trying to keep from saying something. And a voice comes into your mind and says, just go ahead on and say it. Yeah, go on, go on. The other people want to say it. You, you say it first. They'll come behind you and say it too. And the next thing you, you, you say it, man, and, and nobody else say nothing. They'll be looking at you like, I wouldn't have said that. You know why? Satan, he's determined to trip you up. He's determined, determined, the word means he's determined to drink you whole in one gulp. We've seen his description, we've seen his determination, but what about his destruction? Seeking about whom he may devour. Make no mistake about it. Satan is not just trying to make you miserable. Satan wants to destroy you. The Bible says, the thief comes but for to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Make it, no mistake about it. When Satan, Satan gets you through the lust of the eyes and the lust of the flesh and pride of life, he's not coming to make you miserable. Oh, that does happen. He wants to destroy you. He wants to destroy your family. He wants to destroy your marriage. He wants to destroy your life. He wants to destroy the relationship you have on the job. He wants to kill, steal, and destroy you. Make no mistake about it. He'll give you some good things to bring you to the brink of death. And he'll flick you with even with, with sin and the disease. The woman, the daughter of Abraham, had this, this, this disease. And Jesus said, ought not this daughter of Abraham, who Satan had bound low all these years, be loose from her infirmity? Luke chapter 13, verse 16. Even Job himself, Satan afflicted him with sores. But let me caution you. Every time you're going through something, don't blame Satan. Don't, don't, uh, Warren Worsby says, you can't blame Satan for every headache, every backache. He's not hiding behind every bush. If you have high rent, that ain't got nothing to do with Satan. They're just charging you high rent. We like to blame the devil for everything. No, some of the stuff I've done because I'm a sinner saved by grace. Yeah. And every once in a while, that old man, old man rears this early, ugly head, and I just do some things that I was bent on doing anyway. But thank God for grace. Thank God for mercy. Thank God for Jesus. For when I'm wrong, Christ has a way of cleaning me up, fixing me. Satan, he wants to destroy you. He wants to make it so that when you go to high school, because you've been on Facebook, and when you want to get on the sports team, they see the pictures you put out there. No, nah, we don't want you. When you go to the job, some of you adults, because you was old and, you know, with the Me Too movement, all the movements, now they go back 55 years and say, he won a baby suit 55 years ago. He was dressed like a girl. 55 years ago, man, I was only two years old, so they, I was dressed like, what, what? But you, but you know what happens? Satan uses some of that stuff to destroy you in the future. Amen. So be careful what you're putting on Facebook. Be careful what you're saying on, uh, uh, what's, the, what's the place y'all talk about? Chat room and MySpace and what else? Twitter and Twitter and Twitter, whatever. What's that? What else y'all got? Come on, help me. Instagram and text and who else? Snapchat. See, look, they ain't yet 10 years old. They knew all them things before I knew them. They just called them off, called them off, called them off, called them off. But you better be careful what you say on Facebook. You're going to get that degree. You're going to go to that company. They're going to research your background, and they're going to see you say something or post something. You know what they're going to say? No, thank you. And Satan said, I didn't get them yesterday, but I got them today. Amen. Satan will wait a long time. He'll hide behind the bushes and the weeds. 
And eventually, though, he's going to pounce on you. He's going to separate you from the crowd, and he's going to get you. You know, I like lion movies. Y'all like Wild Kingdom and, and all, those, all those different lion movies? Well, the, the lion pride, they hunt more so than the male. The male is just a hyena killer. He does all the killing. But the, the, the female lions, the lioness, they hunt. And they're good. They hide in the bushes. And what they do in the bushes, they're waiting for a weak animal or a, a young kid animal or somebody got separated from, from the herd. And what they do is they're good, too. When they get separated, they chase them that way and want to swipe. And they'll play with them, too. Swipe. See, that's what Satan does. He plays with you. Lust of the eyes. It's okay. You can look at that. He playing with you now. The line play. Poof. You get back up, run again, poop, another one hits you right there. You thought you got it, another one hits you, poop. Right? That's how they do. Ah, got you on the leg. You think you got away, right? He tripping you up now. Oh, it's okay, lust of the eyes. Then the lust of the flesh. Man, I got to have it. He plays with you a little bit more. And then when you do it, guess what the lioness does? They don't tear him apart at first. They grab you by the throat and choke off and you die by asphyxiation. Satan doesn't destroy you at first all the way. He plays with you. A little sin here, a little sin there. He don't play with you all the way, a little sin here, a little sin there. But eventually what he does, he grabs you by the throat and choke you off from the word of God and choke you off from the saints of God. He cuts off your air. You can't breathe no more. You can't walk no more. You are done now in the spiritual warfare. Satan has his fill of you now. Let me move on. Y'all getting scared. Let me see. The adversary. Let me give you the answer then. In, in verse 9 and 10, he gives us the answer. He says, he says, first he says, listen now, the admonishing, I, I want you to be sober. I want you to be vigilant. He says, then the adversary, he says, here's his description. Here's his what? Determination. Here's his destruction. He wants to destroy your lives, your families, everything you have, he wants to destroy. And he'll cut you off bit by bit. And then we see the answer. The very first thing he said in verse 9, he says, resist steadfast in the faith. He said, if you want to win, he says, then the victory is already yours, but you got to resist steadfast. That means be immovable, Sister Jones. When Satan tried to tempt you with something you know against the word of God, be immovable. Be like Jesus when he was in the wilderness. Satan said, if you turn the bread to stone, you can eat. Jesus said, but it's written, man should not live by bread alone. But you know that Satan didn't quit, right? He came back again. He says, listen, just throw yourself down. Psalm 91 said he give you angel charge of you. Jesus said, it's written what? Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Satan wasn't finished, though. He came back again. He said, listen, I'm going to take you to the pinnacle of this mountain. And, and listen, I give you all these if you bow down and worship me. But Jesus said, it is written, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and only him shall thou serve. You see what Jesus did? You got to remain steadfast in the faith. No matter what comes your way, you got to understand who Jesus Christ is. You got to believe God's word. You got to hold on to that word. You got to hide that word in your heart so you might not sin against God. I'm telling you, the answer to temptations is to resist steadfast. Be unmovable. Start singing. Start praying. Start shouting. Start saying, help me, Jesus. I plead the blood of Jesus. I need you right now. Satan is trying to have his fill of me. He's shaking me. He's tripping me up. Start crying out, Master, I stretch my hand to thee. No other help. I need you, Jesus. I can't make it through another moment. The devil almost had me bound, but the blood of Christ, the blood of Christ cleaned me up. Prayer was sent up for me. Somebody prayed for me because I couldn't pray for myself. He had me so bound up, the words wouldn't come out. But Sister Ford prayed for me. My non and poppy prayed for me. My children prayed for me. The deacons prayed for me. The choir prayed for me. The youth prayed for me. And when they prayed for me, I was able to remain steadfast, unmovable. Always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. He said, resist that fast in the faith. And then he says, listen. He says this also. He says, remain strong in afflictions. 
knowing, verse 9, that the same afflictions are accomplishing your brother out in the world. He says, what you going through, somebody else already went through. He says, you ought to take confidence in that. You're not the only one that's going through. Satan is good to have you thinking you're the only one that lost a loved one. You're the only one that lost a job. You're the only one that lost a friend. You're the only one that lost a car, lost a house, lost whatever. You're the only one that lost that husband. Maybe you should have lost him or her, whatever. But Satan have you thinking that you're the only one that lost something. I want you to know you can be strong knowing that I've been through some things just like you're going through. And the God that brought me through, he'll bring you through. How do you get through forward? Jesus brought me over. He brought me over the rough side of the mountain. He brought me through the valleys. He brought me through trials and tribulations. And if God can bring me through, then God can bring you through. Hold on, my sister. Hold on, my brother. Christ is on the way. Deliverance is coming. God is able to keep you from falling. Remain steadfast in the faith. And then he says this right here. He says then, not only remain steadfast in the faith, but he goes and he says now, uh, remember, verse 10, remember the grace of God. He says, but the grace of God who had called us into his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. He says, remember the grace of God. Remember that God's grace is sufficient. So whenever you're going through, say, Lord, you promised me more grace. You promised me grace on top of grace. And right now, Lord, if you don't give me some grace, I'm going to fall. If you don't give me some grace, Lord, I am going to be taken over by the waves and the billows. I need more grace. And he said the grace of God and eternal glory by Christ Jesus. Joshua said it, I think, but somebody said it up here. Uh, Alan Alverson would only call AI. Well, he won't only call AI. Before that, he would call what? The answer. And every time Philadelphia, I man, I saw it one time because Michael Jordan, my favorite prayer, but when Michael Jordan got old and the Bulls were trying to beat him, the Bulls beat him, but they, they bought the answer. Allen, Allison. And that joker put a cross over on Jordan, and he did like this. Crossed him up and went to the hole, the answer. And every time Philadelphia needed somebody to give an answer, they called on the answer. But something happened to the answer. His skills got old. He got old. He wasn't the answer anymore. But I want you to know, we got an answer. And his name is Jesus Christ. And he never gets old. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And if you need some deliverance, call on the answer. If you need some peace, call on the answer. If you need some joy, call on the answer. If you need whatever you need, call on the answer. And Jesus Christ will deliver you. So yes, Satan is an adversary, but we have an answer and his name is Jesus Christ, the righteous. And no matter what you're going through, all you got to do is say, Lord, send down the answer. And Christ is on his way. Lord, I'm going through the answer. Jesus Christ is the answer for all your needs. You need healing, Call on the answer. You need your chains broken off of you. He's the answer. My brothers and sisters, whatever you're going through, Jesus Christ is the answer to all your problems, to all your difficulties, and all your trials and tribulations. It do not yet appear what we shall be, but we know when the answer shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he really is. So be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. And when the roaring lion come, just know that God has taken his right hand and broken his cheekbone, knocked out his teeth, and now all he can do is roar, roar. But he has no bite because God took his teeth out. Because the victory is already yours. Watch out. Watch out. Watch out, watch out, watch out. The adversary, the devil, like a roaring lion, is seeking whom he may devour. But watch out, my answer is on the way. My answer is coming right on time. Jesus Christ is the answer. He's the way, the truth, and the life. Watch out, watch out.